In fact, we both graduated from Romeo High School in 1912. Yep, here's a photo of me on the Romeo High School varsity baseball team. But to the matter of this gravesite, before my illness and death, Olive and I discussed an emerging concept, cremation, and we chose that. Our ashes are elsewhere. Our son and his wife are there. Olive and I are guests today of the Richmond Area Association Historic and Genealogic Society. We both are grateful for the invitation and the chance to be above ground, even for this brief interval. <laughs> Your life today is action-packed, and we appreciate that, but so was ours. Before we share our individual contributions, and in keeping with RAG's goal to make history more relevant, I'd like to share with you some of the noteworthy events that we experienced in our lifetime, as did the rest of the presenters today. We saw World War I, the Great Depression, World War II, and actually the start of the Korean War. We saw military funerals for the last of the Civil War veterans, full military honors buried right here in this cemetery. We were aware of the Titanic sinking in 1912, the Hindenburg disaster in 1937. These were covered extensively by newspapers, and it was the newspaper heyday. We saw from horse and buggy behind you, through Model T's to a Model A to the 55 Chevy. With respect to the Model A, feel free to inspect, but please don't touch. We saw radio and TV from essentially zero, as well as movies. But in our lifetime, Radio City Music Hall broadcast weekly, Ed Sullivan Show broadcast on television weekly, and full color length movies beginning actually with the Disney. We had the Spanish flu. 50 million deaths worldwide, and Fort Custer, right here in Michigan, was a hot spot. You have COVID, and we do understand that. I was born in 1892, roughly the same year as Olive, but you know women and precise age is not always. <laughs> I was born in Hazleton, Michigan. My father was an itinerant Methodist minister, moved frequently from Turkey the church. He was assigned to Romeo. We went there. He tragically lost his voice and could not continue his clerical duties, so we stayed. Yeah. I attended high school, played ball, and met Olive, and we were close ever since. I matriculated to Albion College, and after some work at Albion, I enrolled at the Osteopathic College at Kirksville, Missouri. During my last year of study at Kirksville, Olive joined me. <laughs> well, I think your last year at Kirksville was your best year because, of course, we were married at a small Methodist church in Detroit. And um, I want you to know that was the first time that I spent a night away from Macomb County. <laughs> Shift gears for a minute and discuss medicine in my lifetime. I am an osteopathic physician. The history of the osteopathic profession is way beyond the subject matter of today, but the discipline was founded in 1874 by a veteran Union Civil War surgeon. First college was at Kirksville, Missouri under his direction. I attended that college and graduated in 1917. After graduation, I did some locum tenens work. That means brief periods covering other people's practices. But I learned of the acute shortage of physicians in Richmond, Michigan, and I made a choice to open a practice and live here. This was completed by January 29th of 1918 when I opened the doors. I wanted to quote a portion of the osteopathic oath that I took on graduation from Kirksville. I will be ever vigilant in aiding in the general welfare of the community. I want to repeat that for emphasis. 
I will be ever vigilant in aiding in the general welfare of the community. Well, all right, we'll begin now. We started remodeling an office for Dr. Mack above the jewelry store on the main street in Richmond. And then adjacent to that office was this cramped little apartment, okay? And I want you to know that on October 6, 1918, in that very cramped apartment, I had my first baby, Joe. Can you believe that? And, uh, oh, by the way, I'm very proud of Joe because he became a petrochemical geologist. And he looked for oil wells, which we have a lot around here, don't we? Okay. We were made to feel very welcome in Richmond. During the second year of my practice, a local bank offered us a $3,000 interest-free loan to procure a residence. Can you imagine that? $3,000 to build a home. <laughs> and then now, so there we were in that new home, and I had my other child, Joan, and she was born, I, I haven't gotten down here where she was born, but when she was born, but it was in 1912. <laughs> Gonna shift gears again, some details of family practice from 1918 when I started practice until 1952 when I retired due to illness. Uh, maybe better to start with what we didn't have. We did not have CAT scanners, we did not have MRIs, we did not have fluoroscopes, uh, we did not have health insurance to deal with, uh, we certainly had no computers and no electronic communication. But as osteopathic physicians we had our own hospital, uh, the closest one to here, Mount Clemens General. We were trained to offer primary care to interact with specialists when indicated and specialty medicine during my tenure in practice was exploding. I want to talk briefly about the Flexner Report. Flexner was commissioned by the Carnegie Institute to study the quality of allopathic MD and osteopathic DO medical education in the United States and compare it to medical education, particularly in Britain, France, and Germany. What was found was that medical education in the United States was woefully inferior to medical education in Europe. I was a benefit of the Flexner Report because in the interval 1910, its publication, and when I went to school, there was a huge push for better and higher quality and more in-depth medical education. There was one little downside. Some graduates felt now they knew everything. No need for further training. As a consequence, I became a strong advocate for continuing medical education. I attended frequently. Some courses lasted as long as two weeks. I studied in Kirksville, Denver, Toronto, New York City. Uh, it was a very important aspect of my life. Well, postgraduate work, as you can tell, was very important to Eli, but it was important to me too because I got to go on all of those trips. I loved Denver, Colorado, for instance. We would go through the mountains, and by the way, we took our daughter Joan with us and her friend. And then uh, we went to Toronto, which was delightful, and then New York City. I love shopping in New York and seeing all those shows. So now I think that you can continue with the history of medication. I was a member and office holder in the osteopathic profession of my county, state, and national society, and I influenced postgraduate education in all three of those venues. Now, to what we did have in the office. When I started practice, we had topical antibiotics. If you came in with a superficial skin infection, we had things like tincture of iodine we could assist in the healing process. Switch to hypertension. We actually called it hard pulse disease because in patients with profound hypertension, the pulse is extremely hard and bounding. We had no effective treatment for hypertension, although we recognized the seriousness until a Veterans Administration-sponsored study was completed in 
1964. Vaccines, we had some. We had whooping cough, we had diphtheria, we had tetanus in 1938. But the vaccines that you are familiar with, there were none until polio of 1955. I had no access to them. Steroids, cortisones, widely used in many forms today. They came out commercially available, believe it or not, in 1954. There were no commercially available cortisone products until 1954. General and orthopedic surgery, they blossomed during my practice career. Specialization was occurring rapidly, but those two disciplines, general and orthopedic surgery, really blossomed. They blossomed for a number of reasons. Certainly the skill of the surgeons, but general anesthetic became much safer. There's also the fact that strict adherence to sterile technique was practiced. And another factor I consider important, rehabilitation began as an organized discipline. So, quick hospice care. We were aware of it. I had read about it in the early 1950s. It was becoming an organized discipline in Britain. It did not catch on here in the United States. And perhaps a couple reasons, one in particular. Most patients during my practice career died at home, and we made house calls. And we had some methods to alleviate end-of-life suffering. We had morphine. So what we did have was the ability to do a careful history, a thorough physical exam. We had some rudimentary lab studies. We had some primitive x-ray studies. And from that, we could usually form a differential and perhaps even a final diagnosis. If not, we had interaction with the specialists. We talked about cases, not necessarily an automatic referral. If that didn't work, we could always go to the medical library and study. Well, you know, having our home, because we had it, we could become more socially active. Well, you know, I just love giving dinner parties. Sometimes I would have a musician come and sing to us or play a piano or something like that. But mostly we were important. We were very active in activities around town because we wanted to follow that oath that he took at the end of schooling, and that was to aid in the general welfare of the community. And we really took that seriously. So our table topics often became involved with needs around Richmond. We talk, that's what we talk about. I think people left thinking they'd take more part in community activities. Um, now, um, let's see, now we, we, we did, we, we aided the general welfare of the community, and uh, also I wanted to say, <laughs> Eli helped start, this, uh, start the Boy Scouts. Yeah, but Olive <laughs> was extremely active with the Girl Scouts. Oh, well, for heaven's sake, well, why not, you know, they were around, and I enjoyed that, too. You know, uh, edu education, though, really meant a very, a lot to us, and uh, Eli served on the school board, and he also served on a, a, the Board of Education in Macomb County, that sort of thing. And uh, I served on the Leadership Committee for Religious Education in Macomb County. I taught Sunday school. That's uh, what I did. <laughs> depression, faith was extremely important to keep people upright during the Depression. Well, these were, that's right, these were the years of the Great Depression. And, you know, of course, that's the late 20s and the early 30s, and there are a lot of needy people around. So the ladies at the Methodist Church would get together, and we would can fruit and vegetables, you know, to give to the needy people around town, and then also add uh, uh, clothes, and we'd find items that they would need. That was very important to us. Olive was extremely active as a participant in those activities. Yeah. All right, the other organization that I want to mention is our Ladies Club. 
those were called the Alley, Lake, Alley Zetas. And um, they, they were, um, well, they would, would take part in community activities and all of that, but I want you to know that they did an awful lot of talking, and we drank a lot of coffee. I mean, boy, oh boy, we had coffee. <laughs> but you know what? We'd sit there and we'd talk about serious things like cancer and syphilis. Oh. But those were catastrophic public health problems <coughs> at this time. <laughs> well, yes, they were. But let's see now, syphilis and Eli, you were talking well, about catastrophic and... and uh, well, our eventful lives ended. Oh, yes, that's right. Mine okay. in 1955. <laughs> and mine ended... Well, I didn't know the date exactly, but uh, mine ended in uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan at a nursing home down there, and I was 84 years old. We lived, we loved, we contributed. And we're glad to be remembered. <laughs> We have a question over here. <laughs> See if the lady next to you knows. We that have is. a question over here in the cart. Jack, might yeah. open it. Sure. Doctor, what did you use for anesthetic when you did your uh, The uh, anesthesia that was basically Shane Ashman, which was a combination of ether, chloroform, and morphine. That was used in World War One and Two. Ether was coming in. I can't believe you had morphine with it. Oh yeah, morphine World War One. Uh, this, by the way, is called the doctor's knife. Uh, this is a replica, not an original. I do own an original. Um, during my practice, early years particularly, many doctors made their own medications in their office. Uh, there were pill presses, uh, and many doctors filled their own capsule. And this functions as a spatula, the same as pharmacists use today to uh, count pills. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Now we will go and see the Hermans. Well, hello. My name is John Michael Herman, and I was born December 22nd in 1877 in a small village off the Volga River in Russia called Laub, L-A-U-B. But I'm not Russian, I'm German. And I, along with everyone in my community, was baptized and confirmed Lutheran. The story of our village began with Catherine the Great. Catherine was a German princess who married Tsar Peter III, and she took the name Catherine when she married him. Well, the Tsar was deposed five years later. He was murdered six months after that, and that's when Catherine assumed the throne. And she ushered in the golden age of Russia. One of the first things she did is order the government to open the country to immigration. And she gave a manifesto that welcomed everyone to move to Russia. Her goal was to settle with settlers the lower Volga region and stabilize it. Is that the path that a lot of enemies had taken to invade Russia in the past? Well, the first manifesto she put out was poorly worded, too general, didn't get much of a response. So in 1763, she put out another manifesto. And this time she said that the Russian government would pay all expenses for anyone wanting to emigrate to Russia. And when they got to Russia, they would get free land, they would, they would have religious freedom, they would be exempt from military service, they would pay no taxes for 30 years, and they had the ability to move back to their native country at any time. So, she then contracted with three companies, one in Germany, one in France, and one in Sweden, to recruit people to come to Russia, arrange for their transportation from wherever they are to Russia, 
and help settle them in the Volga region. Of the three companies, the most successful was the one set up in Germany because 95% of all the people who answered Catherine's call were German. Over 300,000 Germans left Germany to settle in Russia. Now why would they do that? For 200 years, Germany, then known as Prussia, had been engaged pretty much in constant warfare over religious strife or economic strife. And wars cost money. The people were heavily taxed. They were at times risked losing their lives, losing their property. A man could be cross, be cross the path of an army and all of a sudden find himself conscripted into that army and they marches off with that army to God knows where and no one ever sees him again. And if you were Lutheran, you were subject to persecution by the Catholic Church as a heretic. So when Catherine made her promises to a lot of Germans, it sounded like she was promising paradise. So that's why they answered the call. In uh, 1767, the village of Lob was formed by 68 families, one of whom was the Herman family, part of my ancestors. Between 1764 and 1772, 106 villages were formed in the Volga region. Lob is down here, my hometown. And each, they, they took care to make certain that all the members of each village were of the same religion. The Russians called the inhabitants Volga Germans. And it wasn't too long before the Volga territory was producing the the most of the agricultural products for the whole Russian economy. So Lob was established in 1767 and I was born 110 years later. On May 14th, 1995, at the ripe old age of 17, I married Maria uh, uh, Fretzler and we had two children before we left Russia. One was my daughter, Katharina Elizabeth, whom we called Katie, born in 1899, and the other was our son, Johan. At age 25, uh, I decided, along with my older brother, Heinrich, who also had a wife and two kids, to emigrate to America. So we made our way from Lobb to Glasgow, Scotland, uh, got on the ship Columbia and mail, uh, sailed to the USA. We landed on Ellis Island on April 27, 1903. Our eventual goal was to get to Kalamazoo, Michigan, where our relatives and sponsors live. The reason why they were in western Michigan is because the climate and the soil was such that the crops that we were used to growing in Russia, we could grow there, and our relatives were, were farmers just like us. Um, my brother, once we got to America, started calling himself Henry, and we started calling our son, Johann, George. In 1904, we had another daughter, Letta, and uh, we had children after that, but they never seemed to live too long. And then, in 1910, my wife ran out on me, left me with the three kids. So on May 16th, 1910, I filed for a divorce. The grounds was willful desertion. And in September 1910, my divorce was finalized. So why do you think she left you? I think she left me because I fell in love with you, a 16-year-old girl. <laughs> <laughs> well, my name is Dorothea Fink. I was born March 14, 1894, to Philip and Elizabeth Nauman Fink in Underwalden, Russia. And Underwalden is up here along the Volga River. I also am not Russian. I am known as the Volga German also, and our, my native language is German. Alt Underwalden was established in June 1767. 
and it was also my ancestors were also part of the first settlers there in Underwalden. Um, Magdalena and her son Conrad. Magdalena was a widow and her son Conrad immigrated over to um, Underwalden in 1767. <clears throat> and they, it was also under Catherine the Great's agricultural program. Um, I, it, they came from Baden, Germany and I was confirmed and baptized also in Underwalden. When I was 14, my parents decided that we were going to immigrate and over to the United States of America. At that time, things were changing with the German colonies in Russia. The gov Russian government was slowly starting to take away all of the rights that Catherine the Great had given us. So we made our way from Underwalden then to Liverpool, England. And from there we boarded the SS Kensington and arrived in Quebec in November 3rd, 1907. And then from there we boarded a train and we entered into the U.S. the next day through St. Albans, Vermont. And from there we made our way up into the Thumb region of, of Deckerville, Sandusky area where we had sponsors. I, we had Norman relatives that were there on my mother's side. And you got to think at that time it was probably very difficult for them. They only spoke German, so they had to make their way into England and they didn't know the English. They get to Quebec, it's French, they don't speak French, and then back into the U.S. then in English again. So it must have been a very, it was a very treacherous journey and very difficult for them. So <clears throat> once we arrived, in Sandusky. My father, Michael, went to, my father, Philip, went to work for Michael as a farmhand. My mother and I also worked there and we helped care for the, his, Michael's three children. Sugar beets was a big crop back in the early 1900s in the, in the Thumb region. Again, because that's crops, that's what they were used to in the growing conditions were very similar to Russia. Michael and I were married on September 29th, 1910. Over the next three years, we had four children, two twin daughters, which died shortly after birth, and then a, a da another daughter and then a son. In 1913, we moved to Godibo, Oklahoma. I had Fink relatives in Oklahoma. So we, we did some farming there. Again, it, we were growing mostly wheat. Um, the Volga Germans, when they came over starting in the late 1800s, they usually settled in either Michigan, Oklahoma, Kansas, and Colorado. Those were the four states that had the most similar growing conditions. And they also had brought over, in the 1880s, the immigrants who came over from the Volga region brought over turkey red wheat with them, seeds. And this seed and the wheat is impervious to the diseases along the Great Plains and the drought conditions. So it was a good wheat to be growing there. And then when we were in Godibo, I have a picture of our family here. This would be um, Michael and myself. This is my parents, uh, Philip and Elizabeth and our two oldest children, Emily and Albert. But shortly, and my mother also, my parents also came with us to Oklahoma. <clears throat> While we were there, my father then um, passed away in 1915 from a ruptured appendix. And we had two more daughters. In 1917, we moved to uh, Singer, California, which is by Fresno and we were going to farm grapes and fruit there. Um, Michael's brother Henry and his family and his six children also came along and we were all going to return back to Russia for a visit. The day that we were supposed to board the ship, I had dysentery and was not allowed to get on the ship. But Henry and his family went on ahead. 
um, that was the last time we saw them. This was during the time of the end of World War I was going on and also the Russian Revolution was going on. So we, they picked a poor time to go. So they get to Russia to visit the families and that time the Russian government was starting to round up a lot of the Volga Germans and they were exiled to Siberia. The growing, growing grapes and fruit in California was something that we were not all that good at. <laughs> so we returned to Godibo, Oklahoma in 1919. And again, we were growing wheat and cotton. We, re we, owned, we bought a 350-acre farm and we had nine more children, six daughters and three sons. One daughter and one son passed away before the age of two. And then in the 1930s, the Dust Bowl years started. Between 1930 and 1936 was known as the Dust Bowl years. So huge dust storms would move in and they would wipe out crops, kill the livestock, people died and it was very difficult to start to make a living there anymore. So we decided then we were going to pack up and move back to Michigan. So in 1935 we came back up here to Michigan. We came with my mother, um, Katie, his first daughter, and her husband and, and children came up, his three children, her three children, and also our oldest daughter and her husband came with us. Albert, our oldest son, brought the cattle and horses up on a train. We came up to the Richmond area. We settled on St. Clair Highway in Casco Township, and we did farming in that area and the Memphis areas the rest of our lives there. And then um, in 19 November, September 3rd of 1943, Michael became a U.S. citizen, and on May 5th, 1944, I became a U.S. citizen. In nine, we had another daughter when we were up here then. And then in 1953, we bought a house here in Richmond on Water Street, which is now behind what is now known as the Deluxe Party Store and we lived there until our death. Um, Michael passed away in November of 1955, and I passed away in May, May, 19, May 9th, 1960. My mother-in-law spoke only German, and uh, after my wife passed away, she lived with various of her grandchildren uh, because she spoke no English. And uh, when we came back and bought the farm on St. Clair Highway, we joined St. Peter's Lutheran Church in Lenox Township, which uh, was a small German Lutheran church. They offered two services on Sunday, one in English, one in German. It was located on the corner of Gratiot and the Hart Road. We changed the name of the Hart Road to 31 Mile Road. And uh, both Dorothy and I were given Christian burial by Pastor Albert Knoll. Later on, we were joined in our final resting spot by my mother-in-law, Elizabeth, and by our son, Albert. Albert was, uh, spoke very fluent German. He was an interpreter for the U.S. Army during World War II. He was a sergeant, uh, and he liked to say that he thought he spoke better German than half the German soldiers he talked to. <laughs> but he, um, he was awarded the Bronze Star and the Purple Heart. He spent most of his career working at the New Haven Foundry, and then he died in 2008. The wife of Charles J. Cook and the Cook Hotel is Mary Ellen Shepherd Logan. This is the Glenwood Hotel. 
Now, the Glenwood Hotel existed before I did because I wasn't born until 1871. And if you look real close in this picture, you will see that on the porch here are cases of Goble beer. Now, Goble beer didn't come into existence until, oh, about 1873. And the hotel was here before that because the Glenwood Hotel, right there in what was called Ridgeway at the time, was uh, built about the Civil War time. Isn't that something? It's still there today. Anyway, I wasn't born yet, and I didn't know I was going to end up owning this hotel someday. So that was really something. This is my mother. This is Mary uh, Chambers, um, and she and my father were married in Canada, came to Michigan, and I was the fifth child of 13. All born at home on the farm around North Branch, Michigan. And being the fifth child, of course, my father, he was a gruff looking thing, wasn't he? <laughs> my mother looked rather pleasant and she's the one who had the 13 children, go figure that one. But my father was a farmer, my mother was the farmer's wife, the fifth child, so as the older uh, children uh, grew up, I grew older, and you know what my job was? To help mother take care of those children in the house. And so that is what I did. Now, growing up in a small farming community, you pretty much got to know the people around you. They might not have been close, but you got to know them through church or through school. And I met Charles Cook. And we became friends for many years, going to church and school. And Charles's parents, like my parents, were farmers. And they farmed the community, and, and lo and behold, when I was about 21 years old, Charles and I decided we should get married. So we did. I thought, why not? I know how to raise a family. I've had a lot of practice with little ones. I know how to take care of a house because I helped my mother. So we did. We got married, and we moved into the farm right next door to his parents. Well, that was a pretty good life out there on the farm, but we were young, and we heard about this place called Lansing, Michigan. So off we went, no children yet, we went to Lansing, Michigan. And when we got to Lansing, Michigan, we found a little place to live there. And you're not gonna believe what this farm girl did. She owned a cigar store. I <laughs> sold some of the finest cigars that Lansing ever saw. So maybe not so good, but cigars were quite the thing at the time. And this was about 1908. And so we lived there for a couple years and stayed until 19, oh, around 1910. And, oh, we got kind of tired of that city life. And we thought, oh, let's move on. Still no children, so it was just the two of us. We could pack up and move pretty easily. So we packed up and we started looking around and we came across a little place called Ridgeway. And Ridgeway eventually became Lenox, which eventually became Richmond. So we made our way to Ridgeway, and sure enough, made our way to the Glenwood Hotel. And at the Glenwood Hotel, we, we moved into a room there. There were 14 rooms in that hotel at the time, along with a bar and a little kitchen. So we moved in, and Charles started helping um, Mr. Whitaker with the barn and, and uh, the bar and the hotel. And I helped out a little bit too. Oh, we became the best friends with that family and their two daughters. They were just lovely girls. But I want to tell you the stories I heard. Oh my goodness. And this was before we decided that maybe we wanted to stay there. Why we made that decision, I don't know. But in 1906, there at the Garwood, a woman from Detroit, Michigan, um, came with her mother-in-law and her sister-in-law and moved into one of the rooms at the Garwood. Well, it seems that she left her husband in Detroit and he was a big wig in Detroit. He was the president of the United States Steel. And for some reason, she did not like some of his behavior. So she decided she was gonna pack up and get out of town. And where did she go? To the Garwood. Moved into the Garwood for two weeks. Some way or another they made up she packed up and she left and off she went. Now, 
Um, this was what it looked like at that time. And you'll notice in the picture here that this is the, the, the railroad tracks. On the other side of this tree was a real fancy hotel. And that hotel was called the Lennox Hotel, or Hotel Lennox, or the Springborn. It went by all three names. And that was built in the 1880s also by Ferdinand Springborn. So this hotel is on the other side of that tree over there, and they were kind of our competition because we were just a small hotel, 14 rooms. He had three stories and a ballroom that they could dance on. Then on the corner of Grand Trunk Avenue, at the same time that, that the um, Springborn Hotel was there, was a hotel called the National Hotel. So now you have three hotels in that little bitty area right there on Grand Trunk Avenue. But that was a really busy area. Do you know why? Because that's where the trains came in. And what did the trains bring? People. And when people come in, they bring money. So sometimes the Springborn Hotel and the National Hotel would get filled. And where would they go? To the Garwood. Now, we only had 14 rooms, but I'll tell you, we took very good care of those rooms, and I cooked the best meals of any of the ladies around there. I can tell you that. Anyone could have told you that. On the other end of town, the Richmond area north, was the commercial house. And the commercial house also had rooms for people. So we had three hotels in Lenox. We had one at the north end in Richmond. I'm thinking our community was quite busy bringing all those people in from Detroit and Port Huron. So there were the hotels, and you can see again in this picture, the Springborn Hotel, the other hotels. Now, as more people came in, we were really liking that little town, and, and we thought, gosh, wouldn't it be nice just to stay here? So in 1915, Charles and I bought the Garwood Hotel. Now, we were one year into World War I at the time, but business was still good. It was still hopping around there. When, when, when men came home from the war, their families would come to Garfield. Our rooms were always filled. Then in 1917, this was two years after we bought the hotel. This is another little story that I like to tell. The livery man, who took care of the horses in town. He was in our, our bar one night, and he may have been over-served, I'm not sure, but, but he, he was there until 10.30, and 10.30 was our closing time. That was it, at 10.30 we closed those doors, everybody had to go home. So 10.30, the livery man was sent on his way. Well, he got as far as the farmer's elevator, and somebody decided, they would attack him and he got attacked and they beat him up and he managed to find a friend to get him home and he didn't remember what had happened till the next day Sunday morning he woke up his face was just a mess it was, he was all tore up he reached in his pocket he was missing $25 well there happened to be a witness there that day and the witness had told his friend who he thought it was well, these people were not unfamiliar to other people around town. So he and his son took off to the country. They found the two men, and off they went. They, they, he got his money back, and the next day he came to visit us and tell us the whole story all over again. <laughs> 1919, that was after we were married, of course. This is my husband, Charles, and myself. And this was taken because we would never had a wedding picture taken. We didn't have any photos of ourselves. So in 1919, the picture person was there with that camera and took a picture of us. And I love showing this. Now, like I said, uh, with, the, with the Springborn, the trains came into town, stopped there. All the ladies got into their finest dresses and their apparel. And um, another story that happened at, at, at the Garwood, was still called the Garwood at the time, um, was in 1917, the Damon Act was passed. 
and the Damon Act in Michigan was the Prohibition Act. And Michigan had prohibition three years before the United States had passed the amendment for prohibition. So, boy, we heard that that was coming, that prohibition law got passed. We all started stockpiling because we knew there would still be a demand, right? Oh, we hid it in our cellars, we hid it in our bedrooms. Some people even hid it in bathrooms. I understand some of that's done yet today. And, and, and we just hid it anywhere we could, right? Blind pigs were coming up. People had stills on the farms. They were making booze everywhere. And there was still drinking going on because if they could find it, they wanted it. And one day a young man was driving through town much too fast because, you know, now we're into 1917 and the first car in Richmond was in 1908. So there were, there were automobiles around. He was driving much too fast. He had been drinking, rolled his car, happened to be in front of a doctor's house. Not, not Dr. Mack, however. And he and the neighbors came out, picked the car up, pulled the man out, and what did they do with him? They brought him to the Garwood. They put him up in the Garwood for safekeeping until he could heal. They didn't take him to the fancy restaurant. They brought him to ours. And another little thing, that funny thing that happened one time, I think you've probably all heard that little saying, wine and women are inseparable. Well, one day, and I just could hardly believe this really, a pair of $10 uh, women's shoes were stolen along with a wine glass. Nothing else, a pair of women's shoes and a wine glass. Well, you know, every day for weeks, I was going around that bar looking like that to see what woman was without shoes. Never did find her, never <laughs> did find her. But those shoes and that wine glass were gone. In 1915, um, as I said, we bought, we bought the establishment and on the corner of Beecher Street and Main Street was a Ford automobile dealership. And it caught on fire one day. And you can see here that it was destroyed. And there's Hotel Cook. So we had already named the hotel after our name in 1925. And they decided that they would rebuild that establishment. And they did. And so when they rebuilt the establishment, we said, you know what? It's 1925, it's prohibition, things aren't that great, but we still have people coming to see us. And the interesting thing is, is all the establishments around us that served alcohol, they kept getting raided and kept getting taken to jail. But that never happened to us. We were too small, they didn't bother with us, I guess. But in 1925, the Ford dealership burned and we decided we would rebuild. Now, four years later, I think everybody probably knows what happened. That's when the depression hit. So, we bought this little, little restaurant and bar with 14 rooms, thought we were gonna have this wonderful little life there. Then prohibition comes, and then the depression comes, and oh, it was 1929, and it was just too much for my Charles. He got sick and he passed away. Mm -hmm. So I was left with the hotel and the bar, but I had some good help. And a year later, I got sick and I passed away. This was the hotel, the Cook Hotel, after we remodeled it in 1925. Sorry, that would, that would be that. So after the Damon Act, the prohibition, all of those things that happened, we decided, I decided, that I couldn't do it anymore. And, but before I could do anything with it, I passed away. So then in 1936, the hotel went up for sale. It went to, to an auction. And a couple by the name of the Tinkoffs bought it. And they had a family of, of sons. And um, that was, they bought it in 36, and the 1940s proved to be a very good time in Richmond, Michigan, because prior to that, in, in 1936, um, 
the Springborn Hotel caught on fire and burned down. The, the other hotel on the corner, the National Hotel, um, was still serving some food and had some rooms, but that increased our business. And in the 1940s, all of the people that got married in town, and I mean almost all of them, the Rixes, the Shepherds, the, uh, the Penzines, all of them came to the Cook Hotel for their wedding reception. We did wedding receptions, we did baby showers, we did graduation parties. It was just a wonderful, wonderful time. But just a few years into it, 1944, my husband passed away. So my, uh, so Mrs., not my husband, Mrs. Tinkoff's husband passed away, and she and the sons continued to keep the hotel open. And in 1972, Dave Goslin bought it, and he is now the current owner. They continued renting rooms in that hotel through 1975 when all of the men were in uh, working on the oil on, on uh, Wales Center Road. It still had 14 rooms, but one thing had been added, one bathroom upstairs. So all these oil men, and we had three, four men, in, they had three or four men in a room at a time with one bathroom. So they would come, they would come back from the fields they would have a meal, they might get a shower, that's it, they are done, they went to bed. The Cook Hotel is still standing there yet today. It's been in operation for 159 years since the Civil War <laughs> days. And the current owners have had it for over 50 years. Now, it's rumored that the Cook Hotel has the coldest beer in Michigan. <laughs> So I leave you with that thought on this warm day. <laughs> Enjoy. Thank you for coming. Are there any questions? Yeah. In here it says Glenwood Hotel. That's what it was called first. Oh. The Glenwood. Okay. okay. It, was called, it was called Garwood? Did I say Garwood? No. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to get better the second no. time around. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. The Glenwood. I'm sorry. My high school class okay. uh, from Richmond and I, we have adopted the Cook as our official club house. There. Oh, you still, you still, it, is it the coldest beer in Michigan? Absolutely. Yeah, see? There you go. Nothing better than that, right? Thank you so much. Thank you. I, the Glenwood. Thank you for that correction. No, I mean, I... You Yikes. confused me. Okay. The first time through is always the worst. You should have come at 3 o'clock. I'd be smooth. <laughs> okay, you know, now we're going to walk right down. across the drive. Right. Schiller with my older sister and my grandma and grandpa, uh, Julianne and Carl first and all. You see, our family has a town named after us in Germany, near Pomerania. But evidently there were maybe some battles with the folks across the border and most of the people in our town needed to move into Germany further and so we moved into the Brandenburg area and my father was born in Klaushagen, uh, Germany and he was uh, working in a flour mill and he was also being an apprentice to be a carpenter back in Klaushagen as well. Um, in 1863 though they decided to go to Hamburg, board the Bart Schiller and a 57 day journey across the Atlantic Ocean and then we got into New York at Ellis Island. We came straight to Lenox Township, Michigan. We had maybe friends that were here. In fact, our original farm my father bought was on 30 Mile Road, right near, Push right near um, Custer Road, on the south side of 30 Mile. It was an 80 acre piece. See, back then you had to have some money to come over. You didn't get into the country. And so they used that money to buy the farm. About a year and a half after they had arrived, but I was born in between. I was born in June of 1864. Uh, a brother, Herman, and uh, actually my oldest sister's name was Wilhelmine, and then Herman, and August, uh, and then Mary were my family. So I grew up on that Lennox farm, and I met a gal uh, named Wilhelmina. It's interesting that my older sister's name was Wilhelmine, and I married Wilhelmina. And based on the names that I look back in our family, I just don't think they had a lot of names to throw around, so they might change an initial, you know. But we called her Minnie, and she was beautiful. And so we got married in Emily City. Now, my memory might be failing me, so I, I assume she was from that area. 
And uh, we came right back to Richmond Township then, and we lived on a small farm in, on Wall Road for 15 years. And we had cattle and hogs and uh, chickens and farm crops and the normal thing on our small farm on Wall Road. Um, and five of our six children were born there. Our oldest was Grace. Our second born was, uh, had, a, had an illness, a health issue, and only lived nine days. Our third born was Roy Charles. And so you'll see that, uh, well, there's a headstone with my name right there, Charles. And uh, Minnie is right there, my first wife. And in the back over there, you'll see Roy Charles. And then my fourth born was Charles Ralph. And he's over here. Uh, my first born was, was Grace. She's here. And then uh, there's Clarence. Clarence is not in this cemetery because Clarence became... He got involved in education. He moved to DeWitt, Michigan. He became superintendent up there. They named a school after Clarence. He's buried up in that area, and our youngest Florence is right there. Now, we lived there on Wall Road for 15 years, and we had a great opportunity. 160 acres were for sale at the corner of what is now First Sinal Road and Low Plank Road. Just about two and a half miles that way as the crow flies. So we bought that from Herman and Maud. Um, Edmonds, they had homesteaded that property, that 160 acres, that quarter section. And we bought that before First and All Road was even named. And when they came to naming the minor roads, they named them after the families that had the most road frontage. So we had that 160 acres, a half mile of road frontage right there. And so the First and All was named after our family. Now, I want to talk about a couple of my sons. That had an impact here in Richmond. My third born, Roy Charles, he stayed in the farming tradition. And my fourth born, Charles Ralph, he, became, he moved uptown and became an apprentice for plumbing and heating business. Actually, if you know the Rowley family here in town, he studied under a Rowley that initially owned the business. He came to own the business and then his sons, Rob and Charles, carried on the family tradition. If you remember, First and All Plumbing and Heating was right on Main Street, um, kind of across from the First National Bank, right there on that block. And of course, their family grew from there. But I want to focus on Roy Charles because he, he ended up taking on the family farm. You know, my wife, Minnie, she died younger in 1919. And um, my son Roy Charles and his wife Frances got married in 1925. So when they got married, they moved into the farmhouse. And you can still see that farmhouse. My grandson's wife Phyllis owns that farm now and she still lives in the farmhouse. And it's just to the south of First and On Low Plank Roads on the west side of the road. That house was built in about 1850. A lot of logs and timbers and interesting things. Um, well built, definitely a beautiful house. And it's a large house. But then, so when uh, Roy and Francis moved into my home, I moved uptown. In fact, if you go from M19 here onto Main Street and just go up the hill, my house was on the right-hand side just before you get to the more town part of town. And I got remarried. Guess where this gal was from? Emily City. I don't know. Must have been a nice place. Um, so anyway, yeah, I remarried Sarah Lalonde from Emily City. Now, you don't see Sarah here because she's buried back with her first husband as well. Now, she passed away in the 40s, 1940s. And um, so um, by that time, too, uh, when she died, I bought a house on Parker Street, just behind what's now the Marathon Station, the first gas station you get to in town. In fact, if you go out the driveway to the back, that little street is Parker Street, and that's kind of where our house was. That house no longer exists. So, at any rate, that was my final house. But while I was up in Richmond, it was Richmond Village at that time, the farm was thriving. My son Roy and my grandson Gordon, they were raising registered Holstein cattle. And then um, I had a daughter, my granddaughter, Ruth Janet, 
um, was Roy, Roy and Francis' daughter. She married a farmer up in Avoca. But Gordon married Phyllis. But just before they got married, I died. Ah, 1856. <laughs> it was December. And my grandson Gordon married Phyllis on February 2nd, 1957. And they bought my house from my estate. And they had two children, James and Sue. And so um, we, uh, that family grew up there for a few years until my son Roy passed away in 1966. We seem to have these family traditions because when Roy passed away, my grandson Gordon and his wife Phyllis and their two kids moved into the <laughs> farmhouse, keeping this tradition going, right? And so um, that's where um, uh, that family grew. And then Frances built a, rather than moving the to town, keeping with that tradition, she just built a house right on the corner of First and on Low Plank in 1967. It's interesting, that house was later purchased by my great-grandson James and his wife Wendy. Uh, and they lived in there for a few years before moving uh, to Lansing. So, um, it's interesting, my son's wife, Frances, her last name was Quaker. She was Dutch. She was from the west side of the state. She was educated at Michigan State University. And she and two other ladies that were educated as teachers came. And they ended up in Richmond because the first in all house in Richmond, that brick house at the uh, kind of the point there of Forest Avenue and Main Street, they kind of boarded people from time to time, and that's where my son met Frances. She decided to stay here, and she taught in the one-room schoolhouse that was on School Section Road. Um, so fast forward, James uh, went to Michigan State. He was third generation because Gordon also went there. And he farmed the farm until 1997, at which point he realized there were too many people in this county to really increase the size of that farm and decided to do some different things, ended up and Lansing with an insurance agency and occasionally comes back to portray me, believe it or not. It's kind of interesting. Um, and uh, his son, uh, Mitchell, uh, just got married in August of this year and he lives in Colorado. And so James married Wendy Gebauer. Her family had moved out to Columbus Township in the um, late 1970s and they quartered for a while and they got married and they had three kids, Ashley, Katie, and Mitchell. I even have great, great, great granddaughters and a grandson. And two of these granddaughters are right over there, Kendall and Michaela. <laughs> Along with my great grandson's wife, Wendy, back in the corner. <coughs> my great granddaughter, Sue, back there. My grandson's wife, Phyllis, who is in the, uh, in the uh, checkered shirt right there in the audience as well. We have these interesting things with names, too. I said there weren't many names to go around, so we kept that tradition going. My uh, son, Charles Ralph, if you follow his line down, there's a lot of Charleses in that family. Middle names, first names, etc. But I started a tradition with Roy Charles because Roy Charles had Gordon Roy, and Gordon Roy had James Gordon. James Gordon had Mitchell James. So from me giving my third born my first name as his middle name, that has traveled down for four generations. So this buggy was my buggy back before we got into vehicles too much. And it was made by the Paterson Company in Flint. It's a nice buggy. If you look at it, it's even got a little bed in the back for groceries and farm supplies and things like that. Um, so I brought a couple of things. Oh, this is my family when they were younger. <coughs> this is me. This is Minnie. This is Roy Charles. Roy Charles went to World War I. He was an army guy, and you can look by the way he's standing. He was an army guy. In fact, um, victory in Europe, they came just while he was being called up to the front line. So we were glad for that he could come back and actually make it through that conflict. This is my same family without Florence, the youngest here. Years later, this is me. This is Roy Charles. This is Charles Ralph. This 
is Grace, Clarence. I'm not sure who that is. <laughs> so, I brought a few things from the farm that we did. Um, back then, before sawmills, we had to make beams by hand. And you did that, you could say this is an axe, but actually it's an axe designed to take that log right there and make it square. And you chop and you chop and you chop until and it's called a hand hewn beam. And then that beam would connect to upright beams. And you had to connect them somehow, so we used this hand drill to drill through all of that to put a peg in it. How would you like to drill a lot of holes with this drill? Oh my gosh. Now if we were doing a little finer carpentry, we would use this planer, this hand planer and just shave it until it was real nice, make it into a piece of furniture. So with that, that's what I had to say, and I don't know if is there any questions. Great-grandfather lived at 92? When he passed away, yes. Yep, yep. Yeah, oh, by the way, he also was very involved in leadership. He ran for township supervisor in Richmond. He was on a Richmond Township Board of Review. He was president of the Richmond Farmers Elevator, which doesn't exist anymore, but it's down on the railroad tracks there. Um, he was also a director of the National Bank of Richmond, which became First National Bank, that kind of yellow brick building. And when he moved to town, he actually uh, ran for village council, and he served on the village council. So he not only served in government leadership in Richmond Township, but I also served in, um, you know, he also served here in Richmond. There be a lot of Germans out there. Kind of a lot of Germans, yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean, I'm just yeah. different sites. Well, and actually, that's why we came here, because there were German families on that 30 mile, and they built a church right on Gratiot and 30 mile road. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. I'm Henry Hankfoot. I'm a German immigrant. My story begins in Germany, but it ends in America. My family was not wealthy. We worked on an estate fulfilling various duties. It was a simple life without major complications. However, one day the German army came and at that time every estate was required to supply men to the army. In 1872 that became my year. <laughs> Although I was born in 1849, my army papers list me as being born in 1852. Now, I don't know if that's because uh, the estate required that uh, the men be a little bit younger than I was or not, but uh, that's what happened. And you do not argue with the German army. <laughs> so that's one reason why when I came to the United States, all the paperwork, everything shows me as being born in 1852. Why did I choose to leave my family and come to America? Well, after the Army discovered I had flat feet and I was discharged, I returned to the state where I was working and uh, along with three other men was in charge of the horses. It was a job I enjoyed. However, I was not always in agreement with the management. <laughs> I chose to leave for America. I boarded the SS Valdalia on October 16, 1881 with a wicker basket filled with all my belongings. Which is right down there. The trip across the Atlantic seemed like it took forever, but in reality I was in New York within a few weeks. The Statue of Liberty was not there yet. I registered at Ellis Island and walk through the doors to the city a likes of like I have never seen. Knowing I was headed to Michigan on a barge by way of the Erie Canal, I purchased a gun and a mantle clock. Mantle <laughs> clock is in the building over there. Now you may wonder why I bought a mantle clock. Well arrangements have been made for my final destination to be in Casco where the Sager family resided. The Sagers were a family who arrived in the area much earlier, about 1858, and were well established. They also happened to have a single female relative. 
I was told where there was 20 acres of property available to rent near the Sager farm and I chose to rent that piece of property and farm it. As luck would have it, I was soon introduced to Marie Sager, who you know I had heard about. We hit it off and a year later on November 22nd, 1882, we were mar married in St. Peter's Lutheran Church in Muttonville. We settled into a log cabin with my mantle clock and our family life began. In all, we had seven children, five living to adulthood. Our two daughters who passed away are buried in my family's wife's family plot, which is way over in the oldest section of the cemetery. Farm life was a challenge, and my, as my sons grew older, I purchased equipment, and the boys were hired mm -hmm. out to other farmers. This practice continued until 1905 when I purchased 80 acres <coughs> on the corner of Haven Ridge and 32 Mile Road. With this post hole digger, which I purchased in Lenox at the George C. Crane General Merchandise for $1.50, <laughs> I fenced in 11 plots for grazing cattle and crop raising. I, also, I had the dairy cattle with the milk being shipped to the Borden's Dairy in Richmond. My farm grew and I was in need of a larger barn, so in 1911 I remortgaged the farm to build a larger barn. The barn I purchased was a kit. So kits go back quite a ways. I worked the farm for another three years and suddenly became ill. Five weeks later I passed away, leaving my wife, four sons, and one daughter. At that time, only my son Arthur was still living with us and working the farm. Interesting enough, unbeknown to my wife, Arthur was engaged in a long distance correspondence with a French woman. In 1917, he joined the army and was sent to France in 1918, in the First World War. And about that time, son Albert was offered the opportunity by a judge from Mount Clemens who had purchased a large farm up on School Section Road. He was going to be given carte blanche to run the farm however he saw fit. But because of Arthur leaving the farm, Marie asked him to come back and work the family farm, which he did. And one other son, Walter, had left and was sailing on the Great Lakes. He joined the army, was sent to the southwest to guard the border against Pansavia. And when the U.S. entered World War I, he was made a Marine and sent to Panama. In 1919, Arthur came home and he moved to Detroit where he worked for a trucking company and married the owner's daughter. Sadly to say, he passed away in 1939 as a result of the poison gas from the First World War. Basically, that brings the end of the Hinkfoot immigration story to an end. As she had said, I'm Bob Colhagen. I'm the great-grandson of Henry. My mother was a daughter of Albert. She was a second daughter. She married Donald Colhagen, who was from Romeo, but they resided in Richmond and my father was on the Richmond Fire Department for 47 years. Uh, the farm was finally sold in 1981 to the Ryan family. So, are there any questions? I have lots of information. <laughs> What's that implement there? That, uh, that the is Henry's grain cradle. Oh, okay. This is how you cut grain years oh. ago. You had twine in your pocket. You cut it. Oh, I see the. And then you and then you'd bundle it, 
And then those bundles would form shocks. Are there other, any other questions? Well, this concludes our cemetery walk. I'd like to thank everyone for coming. Um, if, you, if you don't That is the basket he came over with. If you don't want your program, you can drop it off at the chapel over the building where you came in. Thank you again.